Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you to, to your speakers. Uh, we are now entering the final stretch, the final session of today's conference, um, and we are now going to broaden the horizon uh, with speakers from three different continents. And uh, the, the topic on the table is technology trade and whether we are shifting from a global to, uh, to more regional approaches. And to discuss this important topic, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce someone who is here now in the studio with me, uh, Simon Pickard, uh, who is the Network Director uh, at Science Business. Simon, I'm very pleased to leave you the spot here. Thank you. Marilyn, thank you very much and a very warm welcome to you all uh, for the closing plenary for this afternoon's conference. And as Marilyn mentioned, we're going to be talking about technology trade, global to regional, and some of the related themes and topics that we'll touch upon in this. You know, are we going to see real impact on existing research and innovation alliances? Um, are we going to see real impact on the value chains that they support? Can Europe's historic values of supporting open science and international collaboration be sustained? And more besides. So, in the next 45 to 50 minutes, I'm delighted to say that we'll be joined by three very distinguished guests uh, from Seattle in Washington, Pretoria, South Africa, and Maastricht, much, much closer to home. So, the three people who will be joining us are the Honourable Blaise Nzimande, uh, the Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation for the Government of the Republic of South Africa. We have Luke Suta, who is the, uh, he's a Professor of International Economic Relations and former Rector Magnificus at the University of Maastricht. And last but not least, Karen Katrin Tor Anderson, who is Deputy Director, Global Health and leads on Alliance Management for Tuberculosis and HIV strategy teams and various COVID-19 therapeutics initiatives at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And based on that title, must have an enormous business card. But anyway, let us start, first of all, with some perspectives from outside of Europe and in particular those from a long-standing international partner of European research and innovation, the Republic of South Africa. Minister Mande, a very warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us this afternoon. If I can, I'd like to begin with a, a fairly obvious question and it is the following. Is the new European focus on technology sovereignty a cause for concern and if so, why? Thank you very much for inviting us, you know, to your, to your conference. And uh, also to underline the fact that, of course, as South Africa, we are long-standing partners with Europe. In answer to your question, I think where I would start is that whilst we understand that countries and regions have got to enhance their own science, technology, and innovation mechanisms, it would indeed be a pity if Europe then were to close itself up and actually focus in an inward way. There are a number of reasons why I say that. First of all, Europe itself, its own advancement in science and innovation has largely been driven by cooperation with the rest of the world, with other regions, not least also the African region. And also the world is increasingly becoming one global center in many respects such that very soon rather than later, the condition of the development of one region will become a condition for the development of other regions. Like in the case of EU and Africa, our fate is much more closely tied together. And instead, what we need to be looking at is how do we expand the cooperation that we already have between South Africa and the EU but between the African continent and, and the EU. And in this day and age also, as we are talking about open science, it would be a contradiction that in the era of open science, we are at the same time seeking to be closed. Indeed, there are threats in the sense that when we are having economic crises, sometimes regions tend to be inward looking. But for us, we think that it is important to realize that for Europe itself, continuing to actually expand, deepen 
scientific relations beyond its own borders is a very necessary condition for its own development as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, so the related question to that is, you know, if these Europe First policies are perhaps clumsily implemented, what could be the unintended consequences for, for South Africa and potentially the African Union more broadly? If, as you say, these, these long-standing alliances and the convergence of science, technology and innovation needs are not fully taken into account? Well, one of the unintended consequences, for instance, would be deepening global inequalities. That's one very real danger. Already right now, we are faced with increasing global inequalities. In fact, even in the light of COVID-19, has actually further exposed that. So that, that would be one of the unintended consequences. But also COVID-19, interestingly, we've got to learn lessons about the question that we are asking because if you have COVID-19 not being controlled or managed properly in any one region, it's a threat to the whole world, given the, the interdependency of the, of the world as a, as a whole. We have had, of course, with, as Africa, a particular history with Europe, which has not also always been great, because also in the past with colonial relations, it set a very unequal relationship. And we do need to correct that for the interests of the world and globally as a whole. So to be reinforcing and reproducing those kind of inequalities could be one uh, very unintended consequences, which is why then we need to focus very consciously that, as I have said, in the development of Europe as a region, to what extent is this also going to contribute to advance or actually pull other regions backwards? Well, I'm, I'm very pleased that you mentioned COVID-19. I mean, I think we cannot possibly ignore the impact that it's also going to have on, on African societies and economies. Um, so if we, if we perhaps take South Africa as a, a case study for the African continent, um, how reliant do you feel you will need to be on technology trade to cope with the pandemic going forward? Well, as South Africa, we've definitely identified under the leadership of our president, Mr. Ramaphosa, the issue to mobilize all of our scientific disciplines in the fight against COVID-19. Of course, our fight has been led by the biomedical sciences under our Minister of Health. But at the same time, we have said right from the word go, we need collaboration by various scientific disciplines because pandemics by their very nature are not only health hazards, they are also social hazards. And very soon also they can develop into very serious political problems. So on our side, our approach has been to say, yes, we must strengthen biomedical sciences, but also at the same time we have drawn in other scientific disciplines. For instance, your statistical specialists, but also the humanities and social sciences to be part uh, of this fight. Of course, we have also specifically been doing certain things that we've been very much proud of, like we've produced our own ventilator, which is South African produced, which is a partnership between sections of the auto industry and our Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. We've also been strengthening ways and mechanisms of actually laying the foundation for the production of a vaccine going forward that as and when a vaccine is found, which we hope it will be sooner rather than later, we are also able to develop our own capacity. So science, technology, and innovation is very important. But one thing that continues to be a threat is that with this COVID-19 and the economic crisis that it is worsening, there is a very serious threat in rolling back investment into research and development and science and innovation especially for regions like the African continent. So it's, it's, it's a very serious threat that is being posed by this, but there's no doubt of the importance of science, technology, and innovation in defeating COVID-19. Well, I think that's a risk that a lot of countries worldwide are facing. And of course, there are significant concerns about the, the capacity for research and innovation investment here in Europe as different parts of the continent emerge from 
the long tail of the pandemic and, and its economic impacts. Um, perhaps if we can move on from, from health a moment to uh, the more forward-looking Africa-Europe strategy. The commissioners obviously um, proposed a new framework for, um, for cooperation between the two unions going forward. I believe you'll be chairing some very important meetings later this autumn about how this is going to be carried forward and, and turned into concrete programs. But um, within this new strategy, the, the green transition and digital transformation are highlighted as two of the five priorities for cooperation. And I think within this broader discussion around technology sovereignty, there's an important question about how African nations and companies can move up R&D value chains in these areas as co-developers and as equal partners. And I wonder if you, first of all, have any concrete suggestions about what can be done within the framework of the, of the partnership agreement to make that happen? And second, do we have very good examples, either at sector level or at intergovernmental level, of this already happening, which could be further built on? Well, th thank you very much, you know. Uh, first of all, these, these, these areas that you have just mentioned are also our priority. We are currently, just to use the South African example, if you, as you are asking for example, we are actually finalizing what we call our decadal plan, our plan 2030. What are we going to be doing in the science, technology, and innovation areas over the next 10 years? And one of our grand missions, if one can use that language, also you're familiar with the neuro is actually the issue of greening our economy but also not just greening our economy also you use, you use the very process of greening as a site of technological development we are investing within the constraints that we have quite a lot into the green economy green skills for instance we've got some projects through our department of higher education and training on supporting green skills. We need green plumbers, you know, we need green artisans. That is going to be very important moving forward to, to begin to actually prepare for the future. But also the issue of digital technology is a very important matter for us. In South Africa, we have got one entity that we are very proud of, which is a, a center for high computational technology which is run by one of our government entities, the Center for Scientific and Industrial Research. But during this year, we should have done this by now, but because of COVID-19, we were delayed. We will be establishing the first of the World Economic Forum Fourth Industrial Revolution Centers, which is going to be focusing on a few things, primarily on technology governance, which is very important. But also at the same time, we'll be seeking to deepen partnership between academia and industry, as well as government in partnering to actually advance the fourth industrial revolution. So we also are, in South Africa, are very fortunate because we had created skills entities called sector education and training authorities, some of which we are, are focusing very deeply into this area of the fourth industrial revolution, which gives us a very important platform, firstly, for cooperation within the African continent, but also for South Africa, Europe, or Africa, Europe cooperation in these very, very critical areas. And so I can, I can potentially anticipate the answer to my final question before we go into the broader panel discussion. But does this strengthen uh, the case for South Africa to be one of the, the leading countries to associate to Horizon Europe? And looking into the future, what benefits do you think South Africa and potentially other African partners can gain from association to the next framework program? Well, the one important platform, by the way, that I should have mentioned is that the African Union has, has adopted an, an Africa-wide cooperation, trade and cooperation agreement, which does provide a very, very important platform also for science diplomacy and for scientific uh, cooperation. Also, the African continent, the, the African Union, again, a few years back, establish what is called a, a virtual pan-African university. In a way, it's like we're anticipating the age 
of virtual education with different regions of the continent specializing in different areas. For instance, South Africa and Southern Africa have been given the task to specialize on, on, on space science. But it's not just for South Africa or for SADC, you know. It's just that space science programs are located in Southern Africa, but it's for the benefit uh, of the African continent as a whole. I think if you look at over the last 10 years, the development of institutional mechanisms, some foundation for scientific advances, are providing a very important platform for continued cooperation with Europe. And also we have embraced and we are embracing as you said earlier, the idea of open science. And also, as we cooperate, we need to be even deepening the struggle for multilateralism, as no regions, as I've said, in future and going forward is going to actually develop and survive without the development of the other. But the last thing that I can't resist saying is that all indications are pointing that the next big region that is actually likely to experience huge economic growth and development is the African continent. So Europe-Africa joint investment is something that is actually like to benefit the two regions and hopefully the globe as a whole as we strengthen multilateralism and advancing science and technology. Absolutely. Well, we will continue some of these topics in a minute, but uh, we certainly wish you a great deal of success.